was going to make it. All right. So we're in 1 Corinthians. We didn't make it too far because we're taking our time as we go through this to attempt to unpack as much as we can from these chapters, from this book. And I can tell you right now, we're going to go through this 1 Corinthians until July, and then we're going to have to take a break to prep for uh, the, uh, the bishop's visit actually in November. We have to start really early to do some classes that some of you need for confirmation. So we will come back to 1 Corinthians at some point, probably in the fall. But for now, where we are is in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. And to recap, the Corinthian church is a mess. They are... They are in the midst of a culture which is hostile to the faith. And they are struggling to be faithful in the midst of a culture that is just synchristic. It's philosophically diluted. It is religiously oppressive towards Christians. And so, does it sound familiar at all? Right? One of the reasons why I think Corinthians is such an important book for us is because it's so contemporarily re- relevant to our day and age. The situation's not exactly the same, but the themes are very similar. You'll, you'll hear echoes of the themes. Um, Cor- Corinth was a sexually perverse place. Remember, even to be called a Corinthian was to imply that you were an adulterer. So, I mean, there's all sorts of of things going on within Corinthians that I think speak to us today as well. And Paul begins in chapter 1 by uh, comforting them and speaking to them of the importance of unity in the faith when in the face of difficult times. Unity in Christ And so he argues against their their tendency to fall into camps. Not that the church ever falls into camps today. It's not, according to Paul, about falling into camps. Where one person says, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow... Uh, Then you've got the real spiritual folks, "I, I follow Jesus, you know, that are standing over there. So we do we see the same things in the modern church. Uh, we you know we weren't the first to invent celebrity pastors, but we have perfected the art. And so but even among theologians, the Calvinists are arguing with the Arminians and with the um, you've got the, the, just various groups in every group. The Puritans arguing against the more Anglo-Catholic and blah, 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 blah. It's not about that. It is about the gospel. And St. Paul would be the first to tell you it is about the gospel of Christ. Every, all the other stuff can lead us to division, can lead us to um, just f- be fan clubs of certain things or people And for Paul, it is all about the gospel. And then he finishes up of chapter 1 talking about wisdom. And the wisdom of God versus the foolishness of the world. It's an important lesson for those who are being faced with and being captivated by some of the foolishness of the world. They need to understand that the foolishness of the world leads to perishing. The wisdom of God leads to God. So if you go to chapter 2. And when I came to you, brothers, you with me now, and did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So on the heels of this whole discussion about the wisdom of God and the foolishness of man. He says, that, and remember, always remember the chapter breaks and even the verse numbers are a much later addition to the text. Don't let that trip you up that, oh, we should have something completely different as we move from one to two, unnecessarily. So he's, this is a continuation of what he's been saying in chapter one. 
about the wisdom of Jesus Christ and his righteousness and how he leads us to sanctification and redemption. That the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. It wasn't to make myself look good. It was not to make, to call attention to me. It was not to impress you with my intellectual capacity. Even though, if you read St. Paul, you know he's got intellectual capacity. No, it's, it's none of those things. But he was in the, in, the, in the realm that he's moving in of public debate. That was very popular, still is very popular, right? Use, you know, 50 cent words when a nickel word will do to call attention to oneself, to do all these things to prop up what you are saying. And for St. Paul... He says, no, I did not use lofty speech or lofty wisdom. And here's the thing. The gospel doesn't need it. You don't have to prop it up. The authentic gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't need propping up with these other bits of scaffolding that we often put up when we've got a weak argument. You ever notice that when somebody's got a weak argument? You get all sorts of things rolling into that to prop it up, make it seem stronger than it is. For St. Paul, the gospel is absolutely strong enough as it is. But on the flip side, don't take this as some sort of anti-intellectual text either. It's not. But it is saying that when he comes to the Corinthians... The important thing was the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. In my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I don't know. Like most things, you can become extremely absolutist on on these types of issues sometimes. Again, it's not anti-intellectual. It's not anti-learning. It's not any of those things. But what is it that you see when a person speaks? What is it that you hear when a person speaks? And for St. Paul, it was that you see the gospel. That you see, that is central. My speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit, whom we've talked about a lot in the last couple of weeks, and in power. So that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, A.W. Tozer talks a lot about this in several of his books regarding the Holy Spirit, regarding the, the Christian experience. In the last, I would probably go all the way back to the Enlightenment, but we won't get into that discussion. But in the last hundred years or so, in particular... I think the church has gotten very impressed with its wisdom and philosophy. Again, I'm fans of wisdom and I'm fans of philosophy. I'm not any anti any of those. But I believe one of the problem, one reason why the church is having some of the problems that it is having today is that we began to depend a lot on the scaffolding. That somehow we thought that the gospel was not enough that we needed to prop it up, that we needed, because we wanted to compete in these public arenas. And the gospel was a little embarrassing to people because it was so simple, because it it spoke of sin and it spoke of death and it spoke of humility that is needed to follow Jesus. How much better if we can prop this up with 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 modern philosophy how much better if we can prop this up with 
with our wisdom. And uh, so I think that there that we are living in a time where many people are rediscovering the simple truths of the gospel. And they're there. It, it's a, it's a, like a, it's fresh air. It's, it's like, it's brand new. Nobody ever told me this. Well, that's because we, and I'm saying using we metaphorically, but we, we really began to become, we, we began to play on the, on the playing field of the world instead of playing on the playing field of the Lord. The gospel has enough power in itself and its spirit has enough power in himself. This is one reason why um, you've seen John's story on the This Is My Story series. I'm hoping to get some more of those done. Why we need to tell our stories of the power of God that has been revealed to us and shown to us. Because I know a lot of your stories. And I want you to tell them. They're not all the same. They're not all ways dramatic. Sometimes it's a quiet movement of the Spirit in your life. Sometimes it is dramatic. There's no prescription that it has to be dramatic or that it has to happen in a certain way. God moves, the Spirit blows where He wills, right? So the idea of telling our stories is so that we keep the gospel right in front of us, that we are reminded that God moved in your life and in your life and in your life, and I can take confidence that he'll move in my life, and you can take confidence that he'll move in your life. So, the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, the Spirit of God and the power of God, that is what draws people into the body of Christ. I have been in so many arguments and I don't think I have ever argued anybody into the faith. I mean, where you're, where you're fighting about stuff, where you're, 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 you're really arguing about stuff. Now, I've presented material, had discussion. That's great. And I don't know anybody... Y'all may, y'all may know of an example. I don't know anybody who has been uh, converted by arguing on Facebook. <laughs> but Lord have mercy, do we like to do it? I think it's actually making our society more callous and more rude. I think it's having that effect on Christians in many ways, too. Um, we've lost some of our civility. But nonetheless, it's the spirit and the power. That's why testimony is so important. That's why talking about what the Lord has done in your life is so important. And I sometimes hear people say, I don't know if the Lord's done anything in my life. I'm like, come, let's have lunch. Let's talk. Let me be a tour guide. Tell me your story. Because a lot of times I think people, it's not like they're afraid to acknowledge what God has done in their life. Uh, because no one's ever, they haven't thought that way for whatever reason. And you, you say, look at, look at here. That's, that's God at work. And then they begin to get excited. They go, really? Well, then that must have been him over here. Yep, that was him over there too. So, anyway. So you see, you see what Paul is doing here? You've got a church divided, a church that is under pressure from the culture, And he is saying to them very clearly, don't adopt that culture. Focus and be unified around the gospel. Don't get focused on this preacher or that preacher or that person or this person. Focus on the gospel. And he's going to go on to say this as we come down this way. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although it's not a wisdom of this age who are doomed to pass away, but the secret and hidden wisdom of God. As opposed to the wisdom that they have been experiencing. He's saying this wisdom has always existed, but now in the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's been given to us. And this is what we want to impart to you. All right. So... 
I wanted to let that set the stage of what we begin to see in chapter 3. So we're going to jump down to chapter 3. So he's talking about all this wisdom. He talks about the natural person not being able to accept that wisdom. And I talked a little bit last class about how the, the, the wisdom of God is foolishness to those who are perishing. But those who are being saved, it is the power of God. That comes from Saint, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. So now he turns back from, from discussions in theory back to discussions in practice. And you can see how he's kind of getting after him a little bit here. Imagine this is like the e-news for the Corinthian church. That's kind of what's going on. But by brothers, chapter 3, verse 1, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Can you imagine if that was my opening line on this week's e-news? But think about it for a minute. Consider it. He, he sees this church and he looks at what they've done and, and how things are going with them. He's not wrong in his assessment. He's not saying this to be mean or to be curt towards them. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. He's looking at the the fruit in their lives and saying, we got to stay with the basics, folks. we got to get the basics down first. That's something you hear around here quite a bit. Get the basics down first. Going back to this idea of what's happened in the last hundred years within the church, and particularly within the, those of us in the liturgical traditions and the Episcopal traditions and the, some of the Lutheran traditions and so forth, there was a sense in which we did not lay the solid foundation and we tried to build up on top of that. And so the the foundation of who Jesus is, what Jesus called to do, how I'm supposed to live my life as a Christian never got formed in many people's lives. But, oh, my Lordy, you light the wrong candle on a Sunday and they lose their marbles. They've been over sacramentalized and under evangelized. You have the wrong stole on. Or you, I mean, every liturgical detail was known just to the nth degree. But a lot of people didn't know Jesus, didn't know the gospel. And, and what's happened to those traditions that did that over the last hundred years is that they're collapsing. They got nothing to say to the culture now. They've got no gospel to proclaim to the culture now. They, if, if you look around, I'm, I'm trying not to name names, I won't get myself in too much trouble here. They're li- basically, they're proclaiming the culture back at the culture. It's the same message. And so, St. Paul is saying, and I think one of the things that, that I take away from this for us at St. Patrick's, is this whole unifying theme around the gospel. This whole idea of laying a foundation in the basics of the faith. And who Jesus is, what he came to do, how we're called to live. And then we can build a a house on top of that. Jesus talks about the same thing, right? The wise and foolish builders, the one who built on sand, the one who built on rock. Because when, when when you're sitting with someone who's on their deathbed, what candle to light on the altar doesn't mean jack. It doesn't. Doesn't mean anything to that family. Doesn't mean anything to that person who's lying there minutes from the presence of God. What matters is what foundation has been built in that life to that point. And so it's just crucial. Can you tell I'm kind of fired up about it? It's crucial. 
And so I got to feed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even now you are not ready for it. For you are still of the flesh. That stings a little. <clears throat> still of the flesh. But he's not wrong, right? Speaking the truth in love, this is it. You're not ready for it. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? Preach, preach, Paul, preach. For when one says, I follow Paul and I follow another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? But let's back up to that other verse, that verse in verse 3. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? I told somebody not long ago, I hope I don't get in trouble for this. Um, sometimes pastoring is death by a thousand cuts. It's not the big stuff. It's the ongoing little stuff. It's, it's this stuff. It's jealousy and strife and gossip that you've got to deal with um, during the week and deal with after events. And it's like there was a great video of a preacher. I was talking to Carl about this the other day. It was, it was, a, it was a, a joke video, but the guy stood up in the pulpit and he opens, the, opens his book and he says, I have, one, I have just a couple of words for the congregation today. And he leans in and he goes, would y'all stop it? <laughs> Just stop it. He looked at one guy. He's like, Joe, you're the worst. You really got to stop it, man. And so, obviously, we can't do that. But the idea is, <laughs> is that you that quit behaving like non-Christians. Quit behaving like non-Christians. One of the things that I'm really big on, you can ask the vestry and the staff, is gossip. We do not gossip. Even under the disguise of a prayer request, which is a lot of times where that happens in churches. Oh, Lord, we just need to pray. In a circle of people, we just need to pray for Margaret. She just started drinking again last week, Lord, and we just pray for her. It's a, that's gossip under the disguise of a prayer request. So you've, the, the church is going to be the church, truly be the people of God. We need to be behaving differently than the world. And that's St. Paul's point. You're behaving in the flesh. Jealousy and strife and quarrels. And well, I follow Apollos. Well, I follow Cephas and our hyper-spiritual brethren over there. Well, we follow Jesus. I mean... So there's a sense in which this is very relevant to the modern church because you've been in church long enough, right? Gossip, backbiting, jealousy. And I'm not blaming anybody here. I'm not doing this as a way to get... Uh, I'm just saying in general, in general, we've got to be very careful about that. The other thing that we've got to be careful about, and I see this quite frequently, we just... A little note for our congregation. If someone hurts your feelings, talk to them. Not about them. Talk to them. I can promise you in 90, I would say upwards of 90% of the cases, they did not mean to hurt your feelings. And I've been doing this going on two decades now. Most of the time, the things that create strife in a congregation around hurt feelings when somebody says something they're not meaning they don't mean to they don't realize how they came across y'all don't realize that y'all's personalities are all different <laughs> so sometimes we're gonna say stuff we're, we're gonna be short or curt or rude and sometimes we're unthinking we're sinners don't forget that me too but Go talk to the person. Matthew 18, right? And then you can come chat with me about it if there's a problem. That's great. But most of the time, people don't mean to hurt other people in the congregation. And if they do, then I will deal with it. If somebody is meaning to hurt somebody. 
somebody's just being cruel or ugly. That's another issue. Anyway, just, just a thought. Just stop it. <laughs> and I mean that with all the love in my heart for each one of you. Um, and I, me too. That's my wife. Me too. Uh, so... So, what then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Verse 5. Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. We're just servants. One of the things I like about the Anglican tradition is we really resist celebrity pastors. There's really not celebrity pastors. There there are a few well-known authors, N.T. Wright, John Stott, J.I. Packer. But you don't have celebrity associated with them, really. And I, I love the fact we don't do that. Part of it is how we govern our churches. It's lay and, and it's very much lay and clergy working together, system of checks and balances, um, the way we have bishops over us to, to have accountability. We, there's a lot of natural resistance to the celebrity pastor idea within Anglicanism. And I don't know... Even among the, the, the brothers I disagree with in some things within Anglicanism, I don't know any of them who desire to be a celebrity pastor. The, 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 we, we are taught, it's, it's, it's beat into our heads that everything is about Christ in terms of what we say and do. The vestments, remember, are designed to help us disappear, frankly. The vestments are designed so that you think only of Christ when you see the vestments. It's not to. It, it's certainly not for comfort or, or coolness. Um, it is so that every week you worship, and visually you're not worried about what suit I've got on, how my hair is looking, or what Father Wesley is is doing with his little flock collar. No, nothing like that. It is. It is the same every week, so you can worship. All right, so I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the growth. The growth comes from God. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He, that's it. He's telling them, he's back on this issue of I follow this person, I follow that person. It doesn't matter. If you're growing, give thanks to God for it. It's not about Apollos or Cephas or God or Father Wesley or Father Ray or Father Chris. It's not about those things. Let each one take care. This is the idea that I just mentioned. Well, I got ahead of myself here. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. What, it's a great imagery. This whole building image is that we're going to build on that foundation. According to the grace of God given to me. So I'm working out of the graces that God gave to me, Paul says. I'm going to do my best with what God's given Like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care, takes care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There can be no other foundation for the church, for the body of Christ, other than Christ himself. And it sounds almost ridiculous to have to say that out loud but it is very easy for other things to slip in and become foundational to the church's life other than the gospel i mentioned one i mentioned how liturgy can slip in and become more more important than the gospel personality can slip in and become more important than the gospel Certain groups can slip in and become more important than the gospel. And he's saying, no, no, the only foundation for the body of Christ is Jesus Christ himself. And that's what I pray for us. So no one can lay a foundation. Now, if anyone lays a foundation, I'm sorry, try that again, take three. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. 
If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. So what we place then on the foundation, if our foundation is Christ, what we place upon that foundation needs to be in congruence with the foundation that we have laid. So is it jewels or wood, hay, and straw? So obviously in the early church, jewels would have, are, are valued as they are today. Wood, hay, and straw are things that are designed to be burned up. This filler. So let us not be about putting filler Having laid a great foundation in Christ, let us not be about putting just filler on top of that. Let us be about pursuing Christ on top of that foundation. What are we doing? Oh, it's almost time. Do you not know? Oh, I better leave that till next week. Do you not know that you, you are God's temple? And the Holy God's Spirit dwells in you. Oh, ah, that's a wind-up for another half hour, so I better stop. But when you get that, when you begin now to see, only you have this foundation, this foundation of the temple, and now he flips it back around to the Corinthians and says, don't forget, you are God's temple. The Holy Spirit lives within you. That's mind-blowing, because where did the Spirit live before? In the Holy of Holies. But now His Spirit lives in me. And I am a temple. I I jokingly say, and I'm I'm a temple on an expansion project, too. So, trying to make the Lord a bigger temple. Let us pray, friends. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for teaching us through it. And I pray that we always have the humility to seek the foundation of Jesus Christ in all things. That we never lose our first love. And I pray that you will bless our congregation and bless Um, our people, and all those that we encounter and reach out to, that we may just continue to build on that foundation for your glory and for your honor. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.